Stop, you haven't subscribed to the channel yet. Subscribe now, we have new stories every day. Now let's go. It was unusual for me to work on a Saturday. The only reason I was in Lancaster today was to calm a special client. I work in a manufacturing company called Pydone. We produce phones. These aren't ordinary phones, but industrial ones designed to operate in extreme or hazardous conditions. They are durable and explosion-proof. Our largest clients are oil refineries, manufacturing plants, oil rigs, and other enterprises with harsh environmental conditions. Today, I had to resolve a minor issue at a large elevator, and I had just finished. I was filling up my gas tank before heading back on the road when I was pleasantly surprised. Terry Harrison, what are you doing here? It was Monica Whitmer, an old family friend. Monica and her husband, Brian, used to live near Reading, and we interacted a few times. That was a long time ago, and I was glad to see her. Hi, Monica. I came to Mannheim for half a day to do some work. How are you guys doing? We chatted for about 10 minutes and eventually, I followed her to their house for a family barbecue. Monica was from the coal regions and Brian and his family were from Lancaster. Most of the people at the gathering were Brian's relatives. I called my wife, Darcy, and told her that I had been caught up with some old friends. Then she and Monica chatted for about 10 minutes. I felt better after letting my wife know that I would be late. The gathering was uneventful, except for one small detail. I was introduced to Brian's father and two brothers, as well as half a dozen of his children. Each of them had the same smile. A fang in the right corner of their mouth protruded slightly, and whenever one of the men or children smiled, their lips curved into a grin reminiscent of a pixie. Curiosity got the better of me. Monica, I need a little help. Do you need more beef or ribs? No, no, I'm fine. I was just thinking about the unique smile that all the kids, as well as Brian and his brothers, have. Oh, you noticed? It's hard not to, especially when you see a whole bunch of them together. It's a genetic trait. Brian, his brothers, and their father have this funny little front tooth. They pass it on to their kids, and their kids will pass it on to theirs. It's pretty cute, isn't it? I smiled and let her return to her duties as hostess. On the way back to reading, I had plenty of time to think. Darcy and I had been married for 20 years. I met her in college, and we seemed to hit it off. A few years later, I started working at Pydome and have been with them for nearly 19 years. We have two 18-year-old twin sons, Ron and Rob, who were starting at the University of Pennsylvania in the fall, and a charming little daughter, Jenny, who just turned 14. We expected the boys to get student loans and grants to cover their college expenses, and we hoped Jenny would do the same. Darcy and I had a good life, a cozy home, and two nice cars. In two years, I would be eligible to participate in the company's pension plan, and we would have a solid retirement account. Over the years, the company had offered me relocation opportunities several times, but Darcy was adamantly against it. Otherwise, we got along well. Our sex life was good, if not thrilling, and there seemed to be no issues in our marriage or relationship. Darcy prepared a light dinner because she knew that after the barbecue, I probably wouldn't be able to eat much. She asked how everyone was doing and expressed regret that she hadn't been there. Jenny sat across the table, eating silently. The boys were out somewhere, doing what boys their age usually do. Everything was fine until Jenny looked up and smiled. Her right lip curled, revealing a protruding tooth, and she suddenly resembled a little pixie. My appetite vanished completely, and I excused myself from the table. I had no doubt that Jenny was Brian's daughter. Around the time Darcy became pregnant with Jenny, our sex life and relationship in general started to cool down. Darcy never refused me sex, but the spark and passion were missing. I thought it was natural and didn't dwell on it too much. I had used to mediocre lovemaking and expected that it would be like this for the rest of our lives. I wanted more and would have enjoyed it more, but I didn't want to be picky about it. Now, everything became clear on a different level. From her frequent trips to Lancaster over the past 15 years, I could conclude that their affair was ongoing. I'm not prone to confrontation, but I felt I needed to talk to Darcy about it and hoped I could do so civilly. Hundreds of other questions began swirling in my head, and by bedtime, I felt completely drained. I told Darcy that I wasn't feeling well because of the greasy food and slept on the couch that night. The entire next day, I spent in the garage working on unnecessary projects that I had been putting off for too long. I was trying to kill time and think. The possibilities were endless. I knew I had to take some action, and it had to bring me some sense of satisfaction. I wasn't inclined towards revenge, but I wanted to minimize any chance that my actions would somehow benefit Darcy and her lover. My first priority was to take care of the boys. Even though Jenny wasn't mine, I still loved her and didn't want to hurt her. Although I didn't want to hurt Darcy either, I also wanted to make sure that I wouldn't end up supporting her and Brian for the rest of my life.
I was certain that I didn't want to spend more time with Darcy than absolutely necessary. Her reaction during the confrontation would likely determine what I would do in the coming days. I decided that it would be best to have the conversation after Sunday dinner. Darcy was an excellent cook, and that evening's dinner was, as usual, superb. Ron and Rob excused themselves before dessert and went to visit friends. Jenny finished her dessert, and when she went to the living room, Darcy and I were left alone to drink coffee. Something's been bothering you all day, Terry. Do you want to tell me what it is? I guess my thoughts were too obvious. I'm just wondering how long we're going to wait before we tell Jenny who her real father is. There was a long pause from the other end of the table, followed by a deep sigh. It's surprising how long it took you to figure that out. She remained calm, shifting her gaze from the middle of the table to me. I don't think she needs to know until she's 18 or unless she has some health issues that make it necessary. Everything is fine as it is. We won't gain anything by telling her now. Is that fair? Fair to whom? A stable family life is important for a girl her age. She doesn't need to know. I'll tell her when the time is right. In the meantime, just keep your mouth shut. I was stunned. I had just told my wife that I knew about her infidelity, and somehow she ended up dominating the conversation and making demands of me. I thought she should be apologizing and asking for forgiveness for what she had done, but that wasn't the case at all. She acted as if she had done nothing wrong and that everything would continue as it had, whether I liked it or not. My first reaction was to grab her by the throat, but around that time, I noticed a slight movement in the hallway near the dining room. Jenny had been eavesdropping on our conversation. When I fell silent, I heard her quickly retreating. I decided to handle this calmly. Should we consider getting a divorce? I just told you that it's important to maintain a stable family environment for a few more years. Divorce is out of the question. What would Jenny and I do if we split up? I think it would be better to wait until she's older and until things settle financially. Everything suddenly became clear. In two years, I would have rights to the company's pension fund. In addition to a portion of my salary, Darcy would also be entitled to part of my pension plan when she turned 65. This woman had been planning everything well in advance, very well in advance. I had a lot to think about. I sat there motionless, saying nothing. At least we won't have to endure pity sex anymore. That's a big relief. What are you talking about? For the last 15 years, I had sex with you whenever you wanted just to keep you from getting suspicious. This went on much longer than I thought it would because you were damn slow to catch on. At least now it's all over. We don't have to pretend anymore. I might even start going to Lancaster more often from now on. I sat there for a few more minutes and neither of us said anything. I'll move my things into the guest room while you and Jenny do the dishes. I don't want to impose on you more than necessary. You're acting like a spoiled child, Terry. We can sleep in the same bedroom without sex. It's better for the kids. I didn't respond. The guest room had a sofa bed that was incredibly uncomfortable, but at least I wouldn't have to sleep with her anymore. I got up and left the house before anyone could move. I didn't want to answer any questions about where I would be sleeping. After a quick breakfast, I headed to work. I had spent most of the night awake, making plans. It was going to be a busy day. My bosses at Pydome were more than happy to talk with me. I spent the entire morning tidying up all my affairs before clearing my desk and heading out for lunch. As I was finishing a large steak sandwich, I realized I was smiling to myself like an idiot. Everything was starting off well. I spent the rest of the day at the bank, the insurance office, and looking for a job. I got home around 3, which was unusual for me. What the hell are you doing home so early? I quit my job. What? You like that job? Why would you quit? She paused for a second, waiting for an answer that never came. Are you still upset about yesterday? No. I just decided I was working too much and wanted to change. Starting tomorrow, I'm taking a new job at DC Brown. At the feed mill. What the hell are you going to do at a feed mill? Loading trucks and rail cars. No hassle, no responsibility. I'm also hoping to lose a little weight. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. How are we going to pay for the boys' college tuition? That job pays little more than minimum wage. I don't understand what got into your head. What happened to your pension? I needed 20 years to secure it, but I didn't have them. Did you get a severance package? What about vacation pay and sick leave? No, no, and no. To get accrued sick leave or vacation pay, you have to give a 60-day notice. You only get a severance package if you're laid off. I didn't give notice. I just quit. And what about the boys' college? No problem. The bank will give us a second mortgage and we'll get enough to cover the down payment for four years for both of them. They can still apply for any grants or loans if needed. And how are we going to make two house payments? I think the house will be too big for us without the boys anyway, so we'll probably end up selling it eventually. You've lost your mind. Darcy shook her head, unable to believe what I had done, and walked away. A sense of pride and accomplishment overwhelmed me. My plan was coming together. 
Over the next two months, my relationship with Darcy only worsened. However, my relationship with Jenny improved. Jenny became the perfect little daughter, even though she wasn't mine. I wasn't sure if she had actually overheard my conversation with Darcy. The second mortgage on the house was secured without any issues, mostly because I had prepared everything in advance. Every dollar went straight to Penn State University to cover Ron and Rob's tuition. We could no longer afford the mortgage payments, so the house was put up for sale. I quietly sold my collection of guns and coins and stashed the money in a safe place. I traded my BMW for a used Ford pickup to avoid any additional bills. Darcy and Jenny kept their cell phones, but I got rid of mine and told the boys to take theirs if they wanted. I barely made enough to cover utilities and buy food. We had to defer the mortgage payments until the house sold. The bank understood. After the house was sold, we still had about $30,000 left. I took the entire check and bought Darcy a new Lincoln Sedan. I made sure to choose a model with the highest possible depreciation rate. In five years, it would be worth almost nothing. I hope she liked it. We rented a small house in a modest part of town. Darcy started going to Lancaster more often. We never talked about it. I tried to save a little from my paycheck, but it didn't work out. Darcy didn't know this, but all the life insurance policies had been canceled or cashed out. That money also went into my secret account. Jenny and I grew very close. She began to distance herself from Darcy and became more attached to me. I didn't mind, but it seemed to irritate Darcy. The boys were doing great in college. When Jenny turned 16, I asked her if she wanted anything special. She whispered in my ear what she wanted and asked me not to tell her mom. Darcy was absolutely furious when she saw that Jenny had her right canine tooth removed. Because it was growing out so much, the dentist was able to remove it without leaving a gap where it should have been. There was a small sore spot on the gum where the tooth had been, but he said it would heal without a trace. Jenny was thrilled. Darcy didn't speak to me for an entire week. I thought it was a great gift. I lost almost 15 kilograms working at the feed mill. With the right lighting, it even looked like I had abs. I think I was fooling myself, but it was nice to dream. The first few weeks, everything hurt, but over time, it became enjoyable to exercise. Jenny was in her senior year of high school, and we became best friends. It was her choice, not mine, but I was flattered. Out of the blue, Darcy went from being sullen to being happy. She was cheerful and bouncing around like a little girl. I tolerated it for a few days, then cornered Jenny. What the hell is going on with your mom? I'd rather not talk about it. She's acting disgustingly. What do you mean? Three days ago, she found out that Monica Whitmer has cervical cancer. The doctors say she has less than three months to live. Ever since mom heard about it, she's been giddy. I think it's awful that she's taking so much pleasure in someone else's misery. Monica never did anything to her, and she's acting like a real jerk because of it. It's not nice to call your mother a jerk. I don't know what other name would be more appropriate right now. Unfortunately, I had to agree with Jenny. Now that I understood the reason for her excitement, I felt the same way Jenny did. It wasn't easy to put up with her and keep my mouth shut at the same time. I worked a lot of overtime and spent a lot of time away from home. Sometimes Jenny would come with me and we'd wander around the mall for hours. We didn't want to go home. Three weeks later, I was served with divorce papers. Since Jenny was about to turn 18 before the divorce was finalized, there was no issue of child custody. We no longer had a house, and there was no money in the bank. Darcy didn't ask for alimony or support. It was a straightforward divorce on the grounds of incompatibility. I signed all the papers as they were and quit my job at the feed mill. I stopped by the Pidone office and then quickly visited the bank before heading home. Darcy wasn't there. Jenny said she had gone to Lancaster for a few days to comfort Monica. We both had a little laugh about that. I handed Jenny an envelope with $10,000. I apologized that it wasn't much, but I promised to send more later. I explained that I had to leave and that she would be fine with her mother. She was unhappy, but she still helped me pack my things. Darcy could take care of whatever needed to be done around the house after I left. I had no idea what Jenny's plans were after finishing school. Jenny offered to tell the twins about our separation, but said she couldn't be impartial. Six weeks after I left, Monica Whitmer passed away. My friend Tom Kalita lived in a two-story modular home in Ocala National Forest near Silver Springs, Florida. Actually, he lived in Moss Bluff, but no one had ever heard of it. He retired from the Air Force and spent most of his time fishing and going to yard sales with his wife, Wanda. Tom had been urging me to visit for years. It was nice to have a place to go. I had always admired those fishing shows on TV where they catch monster fish with ridiculous looters. Tom spent the next few weeks proving that it was real. He taught me how to cast a popper over the tops of lily pads. It was thrilling to watch giant mouths explode out of the water after those pesky uninvited guests. For the first few months it was fun, but then it started to get old. 
I didn't hear anything from home, mainly because no one knew where I was. I was counting the days until the divorce was final. Tom and Wanda knew what was going on and were very supportive. The day after the divorce was set to be finalized, Tom and Wanda were going to take me to Orlando International Airport. I had packed lightly, so it wasn't hard to get my things together. I left the Ford pickup with Tom as a thank you for putting up with me, and then things took a strange turn. We had barely pulled out of the driveway when a black SUV approached us. Tom had no idea who they were. Clyde Green introduced himself and his partner, Day Fielding, as FBI agents. We're looking for Terry Harrison. Can you help us? Agent Green, apparently the senior of the two, asked. I didn't say anything, just slightly raised my hand. Mr. Harrison, we need a few minutes of your time. Can you help us? Sure, no problem. Tom and Wanda smiled slightly at the group and went back inside the modular home. We all sat down at the picnic table on the patio in front of the house. Clyde placed a small recorder and a notebook on the table. Tell us about your trip to Lisbon, Mr. Harrison. Nothing special. I'm transitioning to a new job in Lisbon. Why now? I assume you probably know that my divorce was finalized yesterday. I postponed the move until the divorce was official. Is that a problem? No, not at all. We're just trying to clarify a few things. Let's cut the nonsense. What the hell are you doing here? And what the hell do you want? I've got a plane to catch, and I don't want to play cat and mouse. Get to the point, damn it. Green and Fielding exchanged glances and shrugged. Green closed his notebook. Brian Whitmer was killed yesterday afternoon in a car bomb explosion. Given the circumstances surrounding your divorce, we felt it was important to speak with you. Wow, just in time. Well, I suppose you know that I've been here for three months and Tom can confirm that. I have absolutely no knowledge of explosives, and to be honest, I really had no reason to wish Brian dead. From my perspective, he did me a favor. I wanted to get rid of her and couldn't wait for it to be over. I'm not at all upset about his affair with my wife. I'm a little annoyed that I spent 16 years raising his child, but not enough to kill him. However, the timing is quite interesting. We know who planted the explosives and we know it wasn't you. What we specifically need to find out is whether you paid for it to be done, and if you know the person who did it. Tell me who you think did it, and I'll tell you if I know him. Do you know someone named Tony Donato from Westchester? I don't know anyone by that name. In fact, I don't know anyone from Westchester at all. Has your department checked phone records? How do you know it was him? We couldn't find any records of calls to Mr. Donato from anywhere in Florida over the past month. The method used to plant the bomb was very crude but effective. Mr. Donato has used the same technique several times before, but we haven't been able to catch him. What exactly are you trying to find out from me? I don't know anything about the explosion. I'm not acquainted with Mr. Donato, and I couldn't care less whether Brian Whitmer is alive or dead. Brian Whitmer was the reason my wife left me, and I'm grateful to him for that. I don't hold any grudge against him, honestly. We just didn't want to leave any stone unturned. I'm sure you understand. Will you be available if we need to speak with you again? Absolutely. I'll contact you once I've settled in. Four hours later, I was on my way to Lisbon. The flight gave me plenty of time to think about the past few years. My relationship with Darcy had been going downhill for a long time. I was too stupid to realize she was having an affair. Worse still, I had been raising her lover's child as my own. I really did love Jenny and grew closer to her after learning she wasn't mine. Once I realized that Darcy was planning to gain some financial benefit from my work in retirement, I decided to take steps to prevent that. Pydon was more than happy to put my job on hold for a few years if I agreed to lead the new European division. The timing was perfect for both the company and me. I hadn't counted on Brian's wife dying, but Jenny was close to finishing school anyway. My new position as Vice President of Operations at Continental came with a significant pay raise, a generous benefits package, and the reinstatement of my previous pension plan. I had some savings that I had quietly set aside, and all my affairs were in order. I felt guilty for not doing more for Jenny, but I could make up for that later. Rod and Rob were finishing up at Penn State, and they were doing well. I was a bit behind Darcy and Jenny in terms of status, but I hoped to catch up once I got settled. The interview with the federal agents went faster and easier than I expected. I thought it was unusual, but I didn't dwell on it. I more or less shelled it with a silent expression of relief, although it made me wonder what had actually happened. Settling into my new home turned out to be much easier than I thought. Now I had subordinates, and they had largely taken care of everything before my arrival. The house, or rather, the villa they had chosen for me, was stunning. It stood on a hillside, offering a beautiful view of the harbor. I attended language courses twice a week, and I had enough time for private lessons. So to speak, life was good. For one reason or another, I wasn't in touch with Jenny or Darcy. In fact, no one except the company and the twins knew where I was. 
Ron was studying in graduate school at the University of Texas, and Rob was now a second lieutenant in the Army, thanks to ROTC. They said Darcy was at the graduation party, but no one discussed living apart or divorce. They readily agreed not to inform her of my whereabouts. They didn't know where she lived or what she was doing, and they avoided asking. Jenny told them everything that led to the divorce and apparently didn't sugarcoat it. It seemed they were a bit upset with their mother. I was proud of all three of my children. A year passed and everything was going well. In early April, I received an invitation to Jenny's wedding. Unfortunately, I received it about two weeks after the ceremony date. In a small note inside, she expressed her wish for me to accept it if I received the invitation on time. I felt sorry that I wasn't there with her. It took my assistant about two hours to find out the current address and phone number of Frank and Jenny Connie and King of Prussia. Hi Jenny, it's Dad. Dad, Dad, you got my invitation. I've missed you so much. Hey, slow down, slow down. It's all good. I'm just sorry I didn't find out about the wedding until it was too late. I'm really upset that I missed it. It was wonderful. And even though you weren't there, everything went perfectly. I really wanted you to walk me down the aisle. Frank is a great guy, Dad. You'll like him. He just got his degree in electrical engineering, and hopefully he'll start his new job in a couple of months. Jenny was chatting nonstop. She seemed as excited about talking to me as she was about the wedding. I was happy for her. I didn't get you anything. What do you need or want? I need to see you and introduce you to Frank. Can you come visit me? Not right now, but why don't you and Frank come visit me? I got a beautiful place and plenty of rooms. I can arrange the tickets if you guys can figure out the timing. Okay, okay, that sounds tempting. Can I call you back tomorrow? Give me your number. I love you, Dad, and I miss you. I can't wait to see you. I'll make it work. Don't worry. Jenny's new husband had everything a father could hope for. He was handsome, hardworking, and ambitious. I liked him, and I felt confident he would take good care of my daughter. Although I knew Jenny wasn't biologically mine, I loved her as if she were my own daughter. Jenny was eager to tell me about her mother. After Brian's death, Darcy felt alienated from his family. They seemed to believe that she was somehow responsible for what happened to Brian. There were also rumors about her affair with Brian behind Monica's back, which made her an unwelcome guest in the family. Without Brian, Darcy had no means to support herself. She was now working at a diner on the turnpike and living in a trailer near Lancaster. While Jenny was getting dressed so we could go out for dinner, I had a little one-on-one -on -one chat with Frank. Any specific plans after college, Frank? Mostly just work. Jenny has agreed to move wherever we need to go, so that makes things a lot easier. I prefer to find a job I enjoy rather than getting stuck in a place I don't like. I think I can understand that. For about 10 minutes, we talked about what he studied at Drexel and what kind of job he was looking for. Surprisingly, he spoke Italian quite well. He picked up the language from his grandparents, who lived with him while he was growing up in Philadelphia. We were planning to open a service center in Parma, and the only challenge was finding a specialist who spoke our language. In this case, experience was less important than education and management skills. I was trying to figure out how to make this work while listening to Frank talk. It would be great if Jenny were close enough for me to see her from time to time. It's good to be the boss. Around this time, my lovely Jenny joined us. We chatted casually as we walked to the car. Jenny, since I couldn't make it to the wedding, what would you like as a gift? Frank's uncle, Anthony, introduced us and he was more than happy to do so. He also gave us a very nice wedding gift. Frank laughed when he heard this. I never expected to receive a wedding gift of $10,000 from anyone, and it was a real surprise to get it from Uncle Anthony. Not that he has a real job or anything like that. I'm not sure where he gets his money, but it was definitely appreciated. Well, I'll have to remember to send Uncle Anthony Connie a nice letter to thank him personally. Oh no, he's an uncle on my mother's side. His last name is Donato. I glanced at Jenny, and a slight smile appeared on her face, like a pixie's, only without the protruding teeth. Thanks to everyone who took the time to listen to today's stories. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking and subscribing if you haven't already. Feel free to share your thoughts on the events in the comments below. Take care.